This is the backup video for European history for Thursday, September the 10th, in the year of our Lord, 2010. Okay. Can you shut that fan off? Thank you. Okay, we will see how much we can get through in a very short period of time. My glasses are on top. That's why you're all really good. There they are. What's fun is looking for your glasses when you don't have your glasses on. Our creation myth, shared within our secular society, is a superstitious belief in science. Why do I say superstitious? Because no one can really know. Yeah. Science is not dogma. This is the big problem I have with the environmental movement who insists that global warming or <laughs> a new ice age or <laughs> man-made climate change because they can't make up their minds which is going to happen is settled science. There's no such thing as settled science. Science is a methodology. It is Aristotelian philosophy applied. It is the notion that you can learn about the physical world and by measurable, discernible, discrete phenomenon, by setting up, uh, by theorizing, by setting up experimental tests, by being honest about where those tests lead you, and by then coming up with a hypothesis or a theory based on that test information, until something better comes along. Also, superstition is when you believe in things that you don't understand. And most people are not physicists. Therefore, most people take it on faith that uh, the universe was created in a Big Bang 14 and a half thousand million or a billion years ago. There are various religions, and our society is overwhelmingly Judeo-Christian. Western civilization was overtly Christian from around 325 AD until at least the 1960s or 70s. It's still fundamentally a Christian society, although it's experimenting with this notion of religious neutrality within the last generation. We'll see how that works. But that's faith. Most people who are educated in our system assume that science knows what it's talking about. So you have the creation of the universe. You have the expansion of the universe, which is still going on. You have the first open, empty spots appear. You have the first stars ignite, the first galaxies form. And around 5,000 million years ago, the Earth forms. Because a nearby star goes nova, sending compression gravitic waves through space to compact a local cloud of dust, a nebula. And that nebula produces Sol, our star. 5,000 years ago, 5,000 million years ago. And around Sol is an accretion disk of various kinds of materials, many, many of which is rocks, uh, which each clump out into a series of planets. So our planet, third from the sun, forms. At first, it's a giant lava ball in space. But eventually, the outer shell cools like chocolate shell on an ice cream cone with soft serve. Then, the atmosphere cools to such a degree that liquid water begins falling out of the sky. And you have thousands and thousands of years of unbroken rain. At which point, much of the basalt lowlands on the surface fill with water and become rusty oceans. And then, what's that? Bam! 
what happens is another planet hits the Earth, smashing it, and the Earth reforms. And so does Luna, our big shield moon. A combination of the original proto-Earth and this other planet. Okay. So the Earth calms and forms again. Chocolate shell crust on the surface. Uh, nickel iron core spinning in the middle. The spinning of the nickel iron core causes us to have a magnetic field. That magnetic field is going to change. It flips its, um, what do you call it? Polarity. Polarity, thank you. It would have to do with the poles, but I hadn't quite made the connection yet. Uh, flips its polarity routinely. <laughs> By the way, the next time it happens, it's going to be bad. The last time the Earth flipped in polarity, it was before human beings built farms. Uh, now we are so reliant, reliant on the uh, force of electromagnetism, it will be bad unless we have, by that point, moved on to a different methodology for our technology. In any event, the electromagnetic field is going to be one of the shields that protects the Earth from cosmic rays and under other space radiation. Because space isn't dark, it's actually light. It's eternal daylight. Uh, nighttime is a tiny little shadow that the planet makes for us to have a respite from the sun's pitiless rays. And at first, the sun's pitiless rays pre prevented all life, any life from forming. But 3.8 thousand million years ago, or billion years ago, something happened. And a group of amino acids come together to form the first life. And that life, for the most of its history, is microscopic and aquatic because the aquatic environment protects it from extremes of heat and cold and because the aquatic environment allows it to basically develop in all directions without having to support its own weight. But eventually life develops into multicellular life forms and those multicellular life forms eventually become big enough to be seen with the naked eye and they eventually come up onto the land and life propagates until bum 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 the permian event i think it's around 400 million years ago i had it written down so i didn't have to remember it but i'm going to do this from memory the permian event is the world's worst mass extinction something happens to the oceans it could be a space war between aliens one of which has colony on this world but something happens to change the chemistry of the Earth's oceans just slightly enough to kill over 90% of the species of life on Earth. It's the worst mass extinction ever. I think the prediction that they had was that uh, volcanoes erupted in Siberia and there was a whole ton of coal. And then it melted all the permafrost underneath the ocean and all the methane came up and that's what heated up the oceans. That's an interesting idea. That, that, that could work. I like my idea of an alien war, but you never know. You know, nobody, nobody that we know was there. We haven't yet found a record. <laughs> but what we do know is that it is normal for there to be extinctions and for there to be occasional mass extinctions. Now, another thing that probably contributed was that the Earth's continents, which are like granite islands on a basalt sea, came together and formed a giant supercontinent. And that supercontinent messed with the oceanic currents, and may, maybe that influenced things too. But nothing really to do. In any case, life has to cut, build itself back, and it does. And it's the Mesozoic, the era of middle life. The, before the Permian, it was the era of old life, or the Paleozoic, to use the Greek. Old life, Paleozoic. The Mesozoic, of course, is the age of dinosaurs which I presume you loved when you were little. I certainly did. I had a little set of dinosaurs, and I, I, I identified with Tyrannosaurus rex because I was a little boy, and I liked the idea of big, tiny, shiny, big teeth. But the T-Rex has these little, tiny arms. You know, if you're happy and you know it, clap your... Because he can't, because his arms are too short. In any event, uh, the dinosaurs thrive... And <laughs> then, what's that? <laughs> uh, an asteroid hits near the Yucatan Peninsula of the Gulf of Mexico, causing so much detritus to fly up into the atmosphere that the globe cools. Now, dinosaurs may have been bird-like, warm-blooded reptile things, 
But they couldn't survive that. In fact, on land, nothing bigger than a vole or a small mouse survived. We also think that the Deccan Trap eruptions, which is a... You okay? Poor Mrs. Wont slipped on the thing. She's okay. Um, that the Deccan Trap eruptions, which are a group of uh, mountains in India, uh, happened as a result maybe an indirect and delayed result of the asteroidal impact, and that they were basically the killing blow that got rid of the dinosaurs and most life. So after its second great extinction that we know about, uh, life has to build itself back again. But instead of it being the era of fish and amphibians like the Paleozoic, or the era of reptiles, dinosaurs, and birds like the Mesozoic, uh, forget birds, they appear, but they're not... The, 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 the Cenozoic, the re era of recent life, Cenozoic recent life, is a time period where uh, birds and mammals dominate. At first, birds, and South America was once dominated by these terror birds. Picture a giant carnivorous emu or ostrich with a really big beak running across the countryside at 45 miles an hour, eating whatever it wants. That's, that, that's a bad time. But they luckily die out before we appear. And um, then North and South America decide, we like one another, let's kiss. And they kiss at the Isthmus of Panama. At about the same time, the uh, sea, the Tethys Sea, between Africa and Eurasia is closed off when Africa kisses uh, the southwestern region of Asia that we now call the Middle East. Both of these continental fusions disrupt what had been a global, tropical, warm water set of ocean currents that moderated the climate. Now, Earth's climate has always changed. During the Paleolithic, Paleolithic. During the Paleolithic, both before and after aquatic life first appears, the entire atmosphere of the Earth is frozen solid ice. On two occasions, we are an ice ball. Uh, during the uh, Devonian, uh, which is a period of the Paleozoic, there's so much oxygen in the atmosphere that you have these giant insects, dragonflies with wingspans bigger than my arms, giant centipedes that could stretch from one end of the room to the other because there's so much oxygen in the air and insects breathe through their through their outer uh, skin, basically. So climate and even the composition of the Earth's atmosphere is, is, is always in flux. But when this warm water conveyor at the equator is messed with by the Isthmus of Panama and the Isthmus of Suez, and Sinai. What you have is the beginning of an instability period that produces ice ages. And we are products of the ice ages. Warm Africa suddenly gets cool and tree dwelling primates lose their forests. And suddenly they have to live in the grasslands. So instead of being brachiated tree, tree dwellers, they begin doing what meerkats do. They begin standing up because you can see farther and you have these ditches, these clever little paws with thumbs that allow us to remake the world in our own image. With binocular vision, thumbs, a large growing brain, and our voice box, we become us over a three million year period. Three million years, very, very short period of time. By when you compare it, three, life is almost four billion years old, and the Earth uh, is just about five billion years old, thousand million. A three million year uh, evolutionary history is pretty short. Modern humans uh, don't appear until about a hundred thousand years ago, give or take. So. And the voice box, again, is about 40,000 years old. So we are a very recent phenomenon. Now, whether you buy all of that or think that that's a bunch of satanic errant garbage because God spoke and said, let there be light, and there was light, and so on and so forth, here's as good a place as any to point out something that may be obvious or may not. I told you. 
what science is. It's a methodology. It teaches us phenomenon that are observable and measurable, how to experiment on them and draw conclusions about it. Those conclusions are theories until something better comes along. Faith, religion, a totally different thing. Faith and religion don't deal with how things work. Faith and religion deal with why things are. Why and how are not the same question. Science is not a religion. Religion is not scientific. If the Holy Bible were to assume that our understanding at this moment in time of scientific truth was real, which by the way, think about it, a hundred years ago they thought about continents rising and falling like Atlantis. It's less than a hundred years later that we developed notions of continental drift, which develops into our current system of plate tectonics. Okay, we scientific understanding changes. Pluto wasn't discovered until the 1920s, and then it was. And it was a planet until it wasn't, because it's a Kuiper Belt object, according to Neil deGrasse Tyson, who I disagree with. In any case, science is incapable of explaining why. It hasn't the capacity. It can explain how things work. It can draw inferences as to why. Religion is fundamentally rooted in unprovable theories in unprovable theses, in unprovable ideas. If you could prove the existence of God, he'd be another fact in a science textbook with all of the significance of a fact in a science textbook. And how many facts? Ooh, the Earth is 93 million miles away from the sun. It takes about eight minutes for light to travel from here to there. That's interesting, but big deal. What does that have to do with why do bad things happen to good people? Why do good things happen to bad people? Why do the good die young? Why do babies die at crib death? Why do we have famine and war? Why do we have natural disasters? Why can we have everything in the world and still be miserable? Why can people who have nothing still be noble and, and just and good? Sometimes. Faith and religion posit things that cannot be proven about the meaning of our lives and the meaning of the universe. But you have to make a leap of faith in order to have religion be meaningful. If religion were capable of being proven, it would not be religion, because it would not be energized by that tension that comes from making a statement that you can't prove and staking everything on it. You think gambling is thrilling? Religious people are the biggest gamblers, because they say, okay, this one and only life I may have. I'm gonna gamble that this stuff is true, and I'm going to live my life to the best of my ability according to these precepts and dictates. I'm going to deny myself this and that opportunity. I'm going to withhold this or that chance to achieve wealth or power because that would be wrong according to my faith. And then you die. And we don't know what happens after that. We might believe, we might hear stories about a great light and yada yada, but we don't know. We don't know. So it's a gamble. And that, the very fact that you're gambling your life on an unprovable theory, that is what gives religion power. Psychologically, that's what energizes it. That's what makes it something worth living for or dying for, or maybe even killing for. Because you are gambling your all on this faith. But whether your faith, see, to me, I don't see a conflict. If the Bible had given our scientific truth to a bunch of illiterate medieval, Middle Eastern shepherds, they, they wouldn't have known what to make of it. Remember, Columbus discovered America and Magellan sailed around the world thinking that the earth was the center of the universe and that the sun revolved around the earth. It wasn't until after that that we developed a genuine heliocentric notion of the, how the solar system works. Psychology is less than 130 years old. And psychology is how anyone who deals with people is trained these days. Whatever you believe, 
about the origins of life and mankind and humanity and the world and all of that, whatever you believe, whether you believe in the scientific explanation as the way things happened, whether you believe in a religious explanation, in my case, I believe in both. I do not expect a bunch of illiterate Middle Eastern shepherds to tell me scientific truth. But I do believe, since I'm a Christian, that they were given revelations by the divine. That's a belief. I could be wrong. Lots of people think I am about that and so many other things. So to me, I don't expect the Bible to be a science book, and I don't expect uh, science to tell me why things are the way they are. They are different things to me. But to some people, to other people, perhaps to some of you, it is very important that science and religion march in some kind of lockstep. And if religion fails a scientific test, then it must not be true. Or if science fails some religious test, then it must be a fairy story. That's a matter of faith. That is a choice that each of us make and go on making or changing throughout, their, throughout our lives. But I am po 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 positing to you the notion that logically science and religion are fundamentally different things. And when you cross them, you're engaged in something intellectually dicey. Also, let's imagine that the materialistic Darwinian scientific Big Bang theory explanation is true. Then we live in an accidental universe. There is no overriding fundamental truth except for what we believe. One of the things I do personally is I try on ideas. To, it's the basically if you want to if you understand what cultural appropriation is, it's the opposite of what I do. What I do to these because I'm a role player. I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons since the seventies, uh, and the way the best way for me to understand something is to try to put myself in the point of view of a person who believes in a particular thing or lives a certain way. Now I can only do that to an extent. I know that. I'm humble enough to appreciate the limits of my imagination and creativity and knowledge, but still. The best way for me to understand somebody is to try to put myself in their shoes to the extent I can and to, to try to draw some humble conclusions from them. Why did I start that? Uh, lost my train of thought. I think it had to do with this. I tried on nihilism for about two weeks in college. That was the point. I tried living in a completely random accidental universe, and I discovered two things. Number one, logically, I don't believe it. I do not believe that you shake up the random factors enough to get us. I do not believe that you shake up the random factors and get intelligent life and get a history that we've survived so long. I just don't. To me, logically, it's not plausible. Somebody has their finger on the table skewing the odds, like somebody cheating in a casino. But that's me. The other thing is, even if I found it logical, I won't live in a world like that. The implications of living in a completely random accidental universe are that Mike makes right. It's the law of force. It's the most primitive law of nature that's going on in the mountains to our east. Do I believe that human life is insignificant? That all of our truths are lies that we tell ourselves to huddle at night and avoid the essential emptiness and meaningless of the universe? No, I, I won't live like that. For me, it is an unsatisfying way to live. Even if God and faith turn out to be false, I'd rather live my life according to them, with them, because to me, it is more bearable being very honest with you. In your case, you're going to have all these choices. Some of you may believe, some of you may be agnostic, some of you may be atheist, some of you may be flirting with neo-paganism, or the giant spaghetti monster who flies. Uh, that's up to you. But consider the possibility that when science talks about truth and when faith talks about truth, they're using the same word for very, very different things. 
logically it may help you understand certain things and it may help you have sympathy for people who think differently than you that's that's a, that's a precious commodity today having sympathy for people who disagree with your fundamental truths that's something that we need more of that is an american trait that we are losing in the fanaticism of the moment on all sides mine included so whether your belief is in god or in uh, and in uh, seven day creationism or in uh, natural evolution the fact remains that all human history starts out in a provable age of savagery we wander the world ignorant of civilization and we live like killer whales killer whales on land the, the society of killer whales and the society of Paleolithic hunter-gatherer humans are very similar. The great division is between men and women, males and females. The women are the camp. The women uh, for humans are the gatherers. The women for the killer whales are the heart of the tribe, the pod. And the women and their spouses and the children and to the extent that they exist, the old are all a part of the pod. But the heart of it is the society of women. So what do the men do? Well, the men are born, and when they're young, they go out into the world. And maybe they find another tribe, or maybe they come back to their tribe with a wife, or whatever. A woman's job is to be the society. A man's job is to go out and protect the society and guide the society. Fundamental difference. If there's a threat, the women retreat with the children and the old. The men interpose themselves to try to stop the threat from damaging their tribe. Killer whales and humans are alike in this. Killer whales and humans are alike in this also. We have the potential for evil and crime. There uh, was a documentary on the oceans called Blue Ocean or Blue Planet about 10 or 15 years ago. I'll turn the air conditioning down. And uh, in this documentary, you see a uh, flying baby gray whale. And baby gray whales don't fly on their own. And uh, it was flying because the killer whales were tossing it like a ball. They were playing a game. We see the same thing happen in another scene in another ocean with killer whales and seals. Whee! And the little baby seal's flying through the air and another killer whale tries to catch it or bounce it with its head like it's a soccer ball, but it's a living thing. Well, it's a dying thing. That's cruel. There's no excuse for it. That's not about eating. That's about cruelty. It's not like a cat playing with its food because a cat uh, is practicing its hunting techniques. Tossing babies into the air and playing catch with them is not the way killer whales hunt. Well, what we've discovered is that some killer whales, who are males, never find a group of women, never find wives. And they congregate, and their language changes, their whale song changes, and they go rogue and they become cannibal. They hunt their own kind. They hunt other whales, they hunt other killer whales. They are the, they are the dangerous psychopath criminals of the animal world. Some of them. We have the capacity for evil too. Like all other animals, we're biochemical robots. Our programming is our instincts. But this giant brain overrides our instincts anytime we want, to some extent. We can choose you don't have to be Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, Zoroastrian, uh, uh, Shinto, or any other member of any other human religion to understand. We have free will. We have the capacity to choose between right and wrong, between good and evil. And some of us choose evil. The most scary thing I've ever encountered in my life is a brilliant person who's frickin' evil. And I've encountered a few of them. I'm not saying it's easy to spot them. I'm saying they revealed it to me. You can see it in their eyes. There's something about them that's just wrong, dangerous, and I never, ever, ever let my guard down around these people. They make a lot of history, psychopaths who are brilliant and very good at manipulating people.
Among human hunter-gatherers, you might ask yourself, why are women the camp? Why do men go out from the camp to hunt, to scout, to fight, and to protect? Think about it. Can any of you guess as to why the men do the more risky, dangerous, out-of-camp jobs? I really have to roll the dice. Because I will. Or I'll just pick somebody. I'd rather a volunteer. See, that's part of your job. Your job is to take an interest and offer ideas. So, spin around because I don't feel like you're dice. And. Beep. Uh, biological difference between the two? Why are men doing riskier jobs in all, without exception, every single one of the Paleolithic hunter-gatherer societies that exist now, and there are a few, and that existed in the past. Why? And get over your modern pretenses towards feminism, it's nonsense, as compared to archaeological truth. We may want men and women to be equal and to have equal opportunities, and we may provide that, but that's something our society chooses. It has nothing to do with scientific truth. What is it about men and women that make men take the riskier jobs traditionally? Like the biological makeup of... What is the biological difference between men and women? Muscles, I guess. Okay, upper body strength is part of it. Now, granted, I've met a couple of women who could kick me from here to uh, Lethbridge up in Canada and back. But in general terms, the average man is much stronger than the average woman in terms of upper body strength. Men are also capable of dealing more violence. Women are capable of enduring more pain. Um, that's part of it. But it actually has to do with something more basic to us and our survival as a species. Does anyone wish to... Take a guess as to what that might be. Sir? It's probably a lot easier for more women and less men to populate than for men. Yeah. yeah. Here's why. And it's not and not even just more. It, it has to do with every man and every woman. For the minimum necessary for a child to be born and to grow up with a chance at surviving childhood. The woman needs to be there to carry the babe for about nine months in her womb, to have the babe, to nurse the babe, to teach and protect and, and guide the babe. And this is why the maternal instinct is one of the strongest instincts among human beings. Do not get between a mother and her child in a risky situation. It's absolutely wired into us. So we are talking at minimum nine months probably better a few years, the, the year of carrying and then several years of nursing. Um, that's at minimum for mom to be around. Minimum, how often does, how long does the dad need to be there? Uh, barely any. What is he needed for in order for procreation to happen? Um... Yeah. Minimum. We men are necessary for a few happy moments. Hopefully happy. Now, it is desirable to have the man protecting the pregnant woman and the man uh, helping to provide food for the young woman who's nursing and, and has to take care of the child and all of that. That's all desirable. It's desirable for both the father and mother to survive long enough for the kid to learn their knowledge, which takes a decade or more. But in terms of bare biological necessity, women are needed for years, at least a year. Men are not. So guess what, gentlemen? We are expendable. If there's a threat that comes towards us, towards our people, we go out and we fight it. Because in terms of biological necessity, we can be spared. We are physically designed for that. Women are designed as biological machines. This has nothing to do with values, with society, with gender roles in society or any of that. This is biological reality. Women are designed to give birth and carry children. Men are designed to 
be fighters, protectors, warriors, and hunters. And this is what happens. In every hunter-gatherer society on the planet, the women gather, they stay together, the men go out and hunt. And you'll see this propensity in the play of small children. Girls tend to have tea parties. They tend to have these very intricate relational adventures. They tend to involve all sorts of people in their dramas. With young girls tend to be relational. Boys, much less so. Boys tend to be much more physical, more about who's the fastest runner, who's the strongest puncher, who's the longest jumper, who's capable of learning how to fight. And boy play is much less about coming together and dealing with the subtleties of human interaction and more about uh, cops and robbers. That is typical. There are always exceptions to these general rules. It has to do with the basic gender uh, separation that exists in our most primitive savage state. There are two jobs, men and women. That's it. All men have the hunter job. They go out from the camp, they scout, they bring back meat if they're successful. The women are the camp. They strip the land dry. You think locusts are dangerous. They are nothing compared to a group of human women taking on the task of gathering. That is why we are nomads. Because in the nomadic Paleolithic hunter-gatherer stage, uh, the women will strip an area completely clean of anything that can be used. And it's going to take a few years for that to come back. So tribes tend to be on a three to five or six year cycle, going around from place to place, uh, stripping the land, moving every two or three months. That is what's normal for us. And again, it's very similar to killer whales in many respects. Any questions so far or comments? if anyone wishes to offer additional ideas or alternative interpretations. Okay. So, at some point, somebody discovers where plants come from. It could have been because they had a seed spitting contest a few years ago, the last time we were here. Hey, Throck, what? Remember when Grok and you had that spitting contest? There were these big orange things, and you got all the seeds, put them in your mouth, and see who could spit the harvest? Yeah, so what? Look over here where you guys were spitting. See all those orange plants? Maybe there's a connection. Maybe plants come from spit. But eventually people figure out that those little nut-like seeds grow into plants. And when that happens, things begin to change. The hunter-gatherers begin to intentionally plant things along their route of march and in their seasonal camps so that they can have useful herbs, so that they can have useful plants. It's not crops exactly, but it is, it is planting and hoping that some of them survive to benefit the tribe. And then comes the domestication of plants, the true domestication of plants, which requires one of the most courageous commitments a human being could possibly make. I'm not going to follow the elk and the caribou anymore. We're not going to strip the land anymore. We're going to stay here. This is good land. It's got water, good rich earth. We're going to clear this field, these fields, of everything that naturally grows, except for what we want. And we are going to intentionally plant these fields. We are going to cultivate them. We are going to garden them. We are going to weed them. We are going to protect them from vermin. We are going to put our fate, like exposing your wrists and your vitals to the universe, saying, world, take your best shot. Because a farmer is absolutely vulnerable. Vulnerable to too much water and rain, too little water and rain, an early frost, a late and lengthened dry spell, hail, lightning, fire, bugs, nor of the normal kind, bugs of the swarming kind, vermin like rats and other creatures that will come in and eat the plants when they're little seedlings and when they are ready to give forth the bounty that we need to survive. And all the while, the farmer is doing their best. There is no way for the farmer to protect the land. 
if they could have a translucent bronze dome overhead that they could regulate how much water, light, heat gets in, maybe. But nobody does that, not even today. Not unless you're in a space colony using hydroponic farms. A farmer is saying to the universe, I am staking my all on the produce of this field. I am putting all of my eggs in one basket. This is what I am doing. And I hope it works. And I'm sure it didn't work. I'm sure there were the human predators of the world that added to the farmer's problems. Coming in and taking the farmer's produce at harvest time with their violence. But eventually farming sticks. And with farming comes the world's first food surplus outside of ant hives and beehives. Ant hills and beehives. Ants and bees have domesticated animals and they engage in organized food production. We are the only other creatures that I can think of that does that. So we start farming. And what do we do with that food surplus? First of all, we can feed the old so that the old don't have to go out into the storm when they reach a certain point where they're no longer productive. The Eskimos still have this. The Inuit peoples of the Arctic, uh, traditionally, when they reach a certain age and are incapable of bringing food in or being productive members of the society, they'll wait for a stormy night. Maybe they'll have a party with their family. Maybe nobody will say anything to anyone. Depends on the people, depends on the tribe. And then as the storm rages and as everyone's asleep, they get up and they leave. They go for a long walk. And hopefully no one ever sees them again. They don't do it because they love life any less than you or I love life. They do it because they love their grandchildren. They don't want to take food out of the mouths of their grandchildren. Hunter-gatherers produce no food surplus. None. Nothing reliable. They produce what they need. Yeah, they'll have good times. They'll have a fire that'll drive animals off a cliff, and they'll have uh, uh, you know meat rain for a while, and they'll get to eat well. And then there'll be hungry times. Farming produces a reliable food surplus. And that reliable food surplus can also be used to make the wisest person your priest. The most common sense person your king. The strongest person your warrior. The cleverest person your craftsman. With the food surplus, we begin having more than a man job and a woman job. We begin having other jobs. You still need in an agrarian society, which is what we have up until the early to mid-1800s in, in Britain, and you still need 70 to 90 percent, maybe 95 percent of your people in the fields. Depends on when and where and how sophisticated your, your, your techniques are and how good your land is. But that 5 to 30 percent of the people that don't have to be food producers, they are everything else. They are your tinkers, your tailors, your candlestick makers. They are your soldiers, your layabouts, your thieves. They are the old and the sick amongst the American Indian tribes of the plains. The same thing happened as to the Eskimos. They are also, or were also, Paleolithic hunter-gatherers for the most part. I'm talking about the Lakota. I'm talking about, I'm not talking about the Pueblos, who were farmers. In the seasonal camp, if somebody had been injured, or if somebody was old, uh, they'd be supported while they're in that camp. But unless there was an overriding reason or a likely hope that they would survive, they would not be put on a travoy and dragged to the next camp. They would expect to be left behind, and they would be left behind to die. Because the tribe cannot afford to have unproductive mouths. Everyone was needed. Well, farming, the domestication of plants, and food surpluses, and all of that. Also, you can use some of your food surplus to uh, care for animals to feed animals. From around 10,000 years BC to around 8,000 years BC, seven or six at the most, human beings are focused on the domestication of animals. We are really good at figuring out the psychology of beasts. And we bring pretty much every domestic animal that we now use under our control at that point. Cows, goats, sheep, pigs, dogs, horses, 
What do you think, Oxen? What do you think the last one was? Because we only did it sort of half. What is the last animal you think we brought under human domination? Take a guess. Of all the domestic animals, what's the most wild? I want you to guess, and then I'll go to her. If you're wrong, we'll laugh at you, and you'll fail at life. But probably it'll be okay. Uh, well, uh, I talked about... No, because that'll give you a hint. If you look at a person's house, look at the farm animals and pets that we have, which of those animals is the least domesticated, is the most wild and fierce? Cow. Okay, thank you for guessing. I appreciate it. I get brain freeze too sometimes. <laughs> dogs. dogs are close, but dogs... There's a wonderful prayer I once heard. God, make me the kind of man my dog thinks I am. Because dogs really care about people. Sir? Is it a cat? Wow! Yeah. Cats! Cats are wild! Cats are only semi-domesticated. Now, Tina and I, my wife and I, we've had cats since we were young married. And we're comfortable with them. We also make our cats very dog-like. My wife says that at best, I treat everyone like a dog. And if I do, it's because I like dogs better than I like most people. But also, dogs are straightforward. Dogs are honest. Dogs care about what we think. Dogs look up to us. Dogs, God, if we, if we were the kind of people dogs thought we were, we'd be in a much better world. But cats tolerate us. They live with us. Maybe they love us, but cats are wild. When we lived in Maine, we had a brand new house, but every season the crickets would come into the basement and the cats would have land shrimp season. They'd go after all the crickets. Uh, and sometimes mouse mice were stupid enough to try to come into our house and our cats loved hunting. They had enough food. It wasn't about the food. It was their program to hunt. Uh, once a bat got into our house, one of our places in Maine and we had uh, we had a couple of cats, but one of them we had took it, taken in. She had been left outside after she was declawed. Those human louses that put that cat out there. I, I'm not a violent man, but I would have loved to have been violent to them. So we took this cat in. She had the fastest paws in the East because she didn't have claws to get stuck. And she jumped up and hit that bat and knocked it right out of the air. Bam, pow! And the bat's like, what? And then it got up and flew away before it could be eaten. Cats are the last creatures we domesticate. But with cats, what do we protect? What do cats bring us? Dogs, too, to an extent, but cats even more so. Yeah. We take care of vermin. Right. Dogs can warn us of threats that come. Dogs can also deal with larger vermin. And some dogs eventually are bred to be small enough to go into rat holes after rats. That's where dachshunds come from. You know, the little sausage dogs that you see. Uh, but... Cats, cats are purpose-built to kill mice and birds, uh, and they'll go after insects too. So if you have enough farm, if you, uh, if you have several farm cats, your fields have protection against creatures that human beings are not designed to fight, and uh, against creatures that farmers find horrible. So we have the domestication of plants, the domestication of animals, and that's where I will leave things. Uh, and we will continue tomorrow with the early civilizations. My plan is this. I'm going to review quickly. Believe it or not, it will be quick. The uh, ancient history course that you had will go into the late Middle Ages, and then we'll go to the Renaissance, where you already read, and we'll go into the religious things. I guess this is something you need to understand. I don't have you read what we're doing in class. Most teachers do. They'll have you read congruently and concurrently with what's going on in class. I don't. I have you read well in advance of what we cover in class. And it's not just because I'm evil. That's part of it. It's because of my understanding of how long-term memory is built. As a history teacher, my goal is to teach your long-term memory. Long-term memory is best served, in my judgment, by having frequent opportunities to learn the same bit of information. So in my system, imagine that a wet piece of clay is being thrown at a concrete wall, and my goal is to have it stick. Clay is the new knowledge, the wall is your long-term memory. So you get to read about it. 
Then you get to answer homework questions about it. Uh, then you uh, take a quiz about it from your reading. Then eventually I lecture about it. You take notes. You take a quiz. You rewrite wrong answers on the quiz. You take an exam later at the end of the quarter. You maybe rewrite wrong answers from that. Then there's the semester exam. I don't know how many there were, but there were a bunch. I think there were like 8, 10, something like that, maybe 12, depending upon how you want to count. So that by the end of the year, each big bit of knowledge that I want you to know, your brain will have had a dozen chances to learn. Sometimes through passive reading and listening, which are different. Sometimes through writing notes. Sometimes through taking tests. Sometimes through correcting tests. Sometimes through studying for tests. Sometimes through illusions that come during other lectures. My hope is, and I've had some success at this over the years, why I still do this, one of the reasons, is uh, so that 20 or 30 years from now, when you're about to make an important life choice, you might have the benefits of some, some historical analog. You might, because history is not about school, it's not about tests, it's about life. Will you remember history when you need to have examples of how people face certain situations? situations like some of the ones you'll face. So that's where we are. That's it. That's the end of the lecture. Uh, I'll see you guys at home and here tomorrow on a video lecture. No questions? Okay. Thank you.